So what the Enneagram says is that when you're in stress, you can actually take on the characteristics of a completely different number. You don't become that number for all time and eternity, but your outward behaviors mimic something totally different than you've ever been. Hey everybody, and welcome back to season three of the Wednesdays with Watson podcast. This season, we have titled Trauma Spaces, Places, and Aces, and we are nearing the end of the first half of the season as we have taken a deep dive into understanding who we are and how God made us using the very effective tool of the Enneagram. And so today, Chrissy and I, hey Chrissy, hi, we have with us Enneagram Type 8 and a dear, dear friend of ours, Jennifer Dunlap. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for being here. We appreciate you being on the podcast. I'm so, so happy. I'm really excited to be with you. Thank you for having me. It is our pleasure. It is our pleasure. So, you know, you and I over the years have have geeked out a little bit on the Enneagram. And so I'm, I'm excited to have you on here. And so we are going to just go for it. So the first question that we have for you is one that was crafted by one Chrissy Lothridge. And so the mic is yours, my friend. Um, I'd like to know what is your favorite thing about how God made you? You start with a heavy hitter questions. This is not easy to answer. I have to say, um, you guys in all, you know, transparency sent me some questions ahead of time so I could be prepared. And I think this one is hard for everyone to answer. It's really hard to take stock and say like, I love this about the way that God made me. I think no matter what number we are. And even for someone, and as we will go through it, I'm an eight, so um, self-confidence comes pretty naturally. Um, Just a pretty good sense of who I am comes naturally, but still really hard to say, what is your favorite thing about the way God made you? Um, So I thought a lot about it, and I think that, you know, just even what I just said, I'm very grateful that God has given me like a real sense of purpose in my life. I always felt like I kind of knew who I was because of him, but also that he gave me a sense, like a true sense of self. I haven't questioned that a lot in my life. And I know that that's a really hard thing for some people to really grasp, but I I do appreciate that. And I love that, you know, like when things get rocky and when things get hard, I, I trust God as my anchor and I trust the way that he's made me. And I'm grateful for that. Well, we're grateful for that too. And I think it's a great, a great answer, right? And it really kind of leads into why we're doing what we're doing. And it's a great opportunity for me to remind people that we are not our Enneagram number, but we are, as Genesis 1, 26 and 27 tells us, made in the image of God. And as Psalm 139 tells us that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And so I think it's really important on the, on in the outset of that you mentioned that it's like, I know who I am in Christ. And because of that, I can come with confidence and who he made me and how he made me. But this understanding of how he made us is so important. And so I was wondering, so you and I had the opportunity to, to flesh this out in a pre-interview. And I'm really glad that we did that because it, it allowed me some time to pray And so for each interview that we've had is so specific as things of the Enneagram resonated differently with each of you. And so I'm curious if you could speak to the core fear of the Enneagram 8 and how this resonates with you in general, just in general, how it resonates with you. Sure, absolutely. So I, first of all, I know we're friends and I love you, but I'm also a huge fan of the podcast. And I loved the episode with Carissa that went through where she went and identified each type and their core fear. And so some of the things she listed as like the core fear of the type eight was that um, we're afraid of being weak or powerless, harmed, controlled, vulnerable, or manipulated. And what really resonated with me out of that list um, was I I definitely understand a fear of being controlled and vulnerable and manipulated. Those are not areas where I operate in a comfort zone. Um, I do not want others to control me. I do not enjoy being vulnerable and sharing transparently with anyone like Like this. This This is really (laughs) scary. (laughs) Um, and I don't like being manipulated. Um, I have a, just a funny, cute, quick story about that is even if 
you know, it doesn't all have to be the hard stuff that we talk about, right? But even from a really young age, I remember I don't want anyone manipulating me or my emotions. So when when sad commercials would come on TV, like Publix or Hallmark, I would get so mad at them for trying to make me cry. Like, how dare you try? I know what you're doing. I see through you, you know? And so, it, you know, whereas my mom and my sister would be wiping the tears from their eyes and probably going right out to buy whatever product that was because it was so sweet and wonderful, I would be like, I see through you. That is so sinister of you to try to manipulate me. So even from a young age, you know, I've really always had my guard up against manipulation and against anyone tearing down that wall to make me vulnerable or transparent. Yeah, I, I've laughed even harder when I heard it this time, and I had already heard it before. I had not shared that with Chrissy. I thought that was hilarious. That's, I was like, hilarious. But, but, yeah. but I love the Publix commercials and wiping away the tears myself. <laughs> but it's really interesting to me that even at a young age, you were able to identify somebody is trying to take over how I feel, you know? Yeah. And, and I won't allow that to happen. Like, I need to be in control. You cannot control me. I, and I'm curious how that affects, and I, I'm going way ahead in the interview, so I apologize, but to, to not want to be controlled, and yet God controls everything. Is there ever, do you feel the rub of not wanting God to control everything when it doesn't feel well, good? Well, I'll throw I know, it. sorry. But it, uh. <laughs> here, then you, I could see where there would be a rub between an in your invi with God. invisible God who is controlling everything and you may feel manipulated and out of control. And so it's, I just wondered, does that, a question. does that, is that a struggle for, for the eights at, at all? You know, and I can't speak for every single eight and it, what a great question, Chrissy, my word. Here are my two thoughts on it. Number one, absolutely. I sometimes struggle with God control at the end of the day, because I know exactly what I want to have happen. And I know because I'm 45 years into this life now that things do not go the way that I want them to happen. And even though I feel like I have logic and rationale and wisdom, when I bring myself fully to a situation, I don't have God's wisdom. I don't see the full picture that he does. And I trust him. Thank goodness, I know God personally. I know the Lord as my personal God and Savior because walking with him throughout my life, I've, you know, that trust has been built too. He, he has never let me down and he can't. He's perfect. His wisdom is perfect. So one of the things I read one time about AIDS is that we don't have to be in control all the time. We just need to know that someone is. So that's the second part of the answer to that question. Like, sure, I have a problem with sometimes leaving the control up to God and what he see, sees best in every situation. But at the end of the day, my biggest concern is that someone worthy, someone capable is in control of the situation. If in a general situation in my life, no one steps up to the plate, I'm gonna be that person. I will step in and I'll fill in that role in two seconds. But because God is who God is, I do trust that there's someone in control that is capable and trustworthy. And so in general, it's a big relief for an eight who knows the Lord because this is a place where we can rest. That makes sense. That really makes sense. Yeah, I actually have have chills. Nothing like a podcast host leaning back and putting their arms together because you're you just got me in a zone on that. I think that that is so huge, mm -hmm. and this podcast highlights who I call the star of the story, which is just my creative way of saying that Jesus is my everything. And as a two who goes to eight and unhealth, that's right. so, Chrissy's question so resonates with me. I wish that I could respond as eloquently as you, but there are so often times that when I am in this stress path, and we're going to talk about that in a minute because I'm going to call you Jenny. Your name is actually Jennifer, but you're my Jenny. Yes. <laughs> because Jenny, you, you bring something to me, you minister to me as someone who goes to an eight and unhealth. I really struggle with, you know, 
taking God off his throne, if that's even possible or getting up there and helping him, you know, <laughs> figure it like you, there's no possible way you can, and you're not going to control me. And I know when I need to go to my prayer closet and go, okay, I'm really struggling with my faith right now. I'm having my John the Baptist moment where John the Baptist set back a message to the apostles and pe listeners of this podcast have heard me say this over and over again, but an eight can do this is John the Baptist was like, it's great that you're coming and telling me all the miracles that Jesus is doing, but can you ask him something for me? Is yeah. he coming or should I be looking for somebody else? Should I be looking for somebody else? Right. And it's just so, so powerful. And as we lean into the faithfulness and the steadfastness of God, really the only one who never changes, the Bible tells us that he is the same yesterday. He's the same today and he's the same forever. However, that doesn't take us out of the reality of living with what we live with, with how, what, for whatever reason, whatever has informed us to be like we are. And so you had, and one of the things that really struck a chord with me when you talked about too, and you haven't mentioned it yet, but it's just this kind of this, the vulnerability you've talked about, but then also the betrayal. Like you even went so far as to say to me, I assume when I tell people stuff that they are going in some form, whether they mean to or not, that I'm going to be betrayed. And so here's my question for you. How, do, how are you then, besides assuming that, do you find that you have to be super mindful of this fear of somebody betraying you if you, if you talk to them or, or manipulating you or controlling you? How do you, help you? how do you help that and stay in community so that you don't isolate and go to that stress path, which we'll talk about in a minute? But how do you stay in community? How do you, how do, you do this with this huge fear that if I tell somebody something, they're pretty much going to betray me. Right. So I think, you know, that core fear of vulnerability has an end result. We're not just afraid of being vulnerable for our own sake of not wanting to share. But in my case specifically, I'm afraid that if I am transparent or vulnerable with someone, that they may run off and tell the next person they see, oh, I can't, I can't you, you won't believe what I just heard. What about what's going on in her life or what she's struggling with? Um, and I think, I still think it's a pretty reasonable fear. I think people just enjoy talking about other people, right? Like we can say like that actually does happen. Sometimes people get betrayed. Um, people's transparency is not guarded closely, but, but that can't be, that can't be the thing that is the most important to me. So I absolutely, I have a very hard time having close friends. I know a lot of people. I like a lot of people. I really do. And I hope people like me. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the seven wing coming out of me. I really hope I'm fun to be around sometimes. Um, but I make a determination. Um, and I've had to learn this over the years. It, it, you know, it, it's taken a while to figure this out well into my adulthood that I do not have a lot of close friends. And if I'm being introspective about that, it's because I don't share a lot of personal down deep stuff with people. So how do you connect with someone if you know, like if they're sharing a certain level with you and you're not reciprocating that, that bond is not going to form the way that you would want it to. So I have to make like a risk analysis mm -hmm. and decide I, in order to have a friend or to make this friendship closer or to have more people in my community, I will need to be more transparent and vulnerable. If I do that, I could be betrayed. I might very well be, like in my case, I kind of feel like I will be. I will be betrayed at some point by this person. If I share something, they'll probably tell somebody else. And I have to get to a point where the reward of connecting on a deeper level with someone is greater than the risk of that. And it's just a fear, you know, of being betrayed. A lot of bad stuff doesn't happen if someone, you know, if my worst fear in that regard came true. And I think that I told you, Amy, earlier when we spoke before this interview that um, at the end of the day, this is where it comes back to God being in control and, and resting in his control because I have to give it to him. Sometimes I have to like physically open my hands and release what I'm trying to control about how people respond to me and in relationship with me and say, you know, the reward is better because, Lord, you have told us that we are to be in community with people, that this is how we do life here, 
right now in the church that we're supposed to be connected with one another. We're supposed to love one another. We're supposed to encourage one another. We're supposed to all the one another's that are in the Bible. This is what we're supposed to do. And so this is where I have to trust God and say, no matter what, and I'm still working on it. I still, I think somebody said eights have like a handful of friends. And that's very true. I probably can count it on one hand. How many people I like really go in depth with. Right. Are there things that um, would, would help the eights in general that would make it easier to be vulnerable? Or are there things that we can do that would mitigate that in any way? The, uh, good question. I, I think it takes practice on our part. Yeah. I think we just have to, you know, that's why I like the Enneagram as a tool. I didn't have words to express this particular part of my personality, like why I don't really genuinely have a lot of deep friendships. And this particular tool helped me really explore that a little bit more. And so I think we, we take what God gives us and brings in our path, you know, like I have this and I have some really good friends in that handful that will keep checking up on me, keep giving me opportunities to be vulnerable and to tell the intimate parts and share my fears everything takes practice if we want to progress, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Any number I think could resonate that whatever your fear is, I think you have to practice being uncomfortable in it and get better at it. I'm still not there. I still, like I said, I still can count on one hand how many people I feel I'm close enough to that, you know, are are trustworthy. Um, And just in all transparency to the people listening to this podcast, it's really cool to me that you guys are two of the people on on that hand and so that probably is what makes doing this podcast with you doable well i feel like i'm i just feel like we're at one of our dinners so just as a little bit of a background for the listeners chrissy and jenny have known each other since well kindergarten kindergarten Kindergarten. five years old five years old so you were roommates in college yep Jenny, one, right. of the things, one of the things that you said to me in the pre-interview, and, and you just talked about a little bit, is that you trust yourself, but not others. And then you said something that was interesting that I think this is, this is going to be a really a beautiful moment in some ways. And so you guys have been friends for 40 years. 40 <laughs> years. <laughs> yes. And you had mentioned to me, we've been friends since we were five years old, but it's only later in life that I even trust Chrissy. Yes. To do anything to, to, to get into that realm of what I call my core four of which you, you guys are two, half my core four. What happened? Can you think of something that changed that was like, now I can trust Chrissy with everything. Like I can bear my soul to her. So Chrissy has been Chrissy since we met. Um, not a lot has changed in her. She, so this, just to tell you like how, how long it takes to trust somebody. <laughs> It's just being that consistent (laughs) person. Yes, it is not the short game here. That consistent person in my life for four decades. That's, that's crazy. But um, I do remember that, you know, we, we have, we've had a great friendship over, we've gone on vacations together. We, we did college tours together and your parents suburban, you know, like heading up to check out schools. And we did, we ended up going to college and rooming together. Um, But I would say, you know, just as a matter of self-reflection, like I had no desire to connect on an intimate level. We were roomies. We shared a fridge, you know, hopefully when one of us needed the other one to do the laundry or clean up a little bit, you know, it was a little give and take, but I didn't really want to get deep. And I think you've always been someone who's not afraid to go deep and be, you are just such a steady person in anyone's life, I think, who's a friend of yours, like if I slowed down long enough, I was probably afraid that you would ask really tough, hard questions of me. Like you, you look into people's souls. (laughs) So I think for my own just immaturity and I had not experienced a lot of life's hardships yet. That was okay with me to just not go there and, and really deepen that friendship to that level that you always have had to offer. So it's probably been, you know, since adulthood and since life has really taken some pretty drastic and devastating turns in my life, 
there's Chrissy. You're still there. You're still my friend who just like pops up and checks in. How you doing? How's life going? And was always, and then I started exploring, like, this is a person who, you know, if we go to breakfast or coffee within two minutes, the surface stuff is not <laughs> needed any longer. And just little by little sharing little things. And you, you don't have to earn my trust. You know, it's not like you ever had to prove yourself with that, but you just, just being there and being the depth of a person that you are just started to build some stability and deepen that friendship for me. And I, I can't even tell you how grateful that I am for that. And same here. And I will say on my side, so vulnerability isn't, isn't my struggle, but trust is. Mm. And I feel like in some ways the Lord intervened and I don't know when it started, but when we would, we would text, it was like, Oh my gosh, me too. Like the Lord would put us in a spot that was like, okay, our lives really don't intersect in a whole lot of ways, but it was on these deep emotional levels. The Lord was going, you two, you're in the same, you're in the same struggle. And so when, when God intervened, it was like, you know, like touched by an angel when the halo would come over their head. Yes. you know, maybe I should pay attention to this. Like the, the Lord is fostering this deeper relationship. I need to pay attention. Yeah. And, and it has, I mean, our friendship has gone so much deeper in, in the past decade or so. And, and it, and I feel like the Lord sort of intervened on both of our behalves because we have different struggles, but, but it's the, it, at the end of the day, it, it caused us both to be a little bit apart. Yes. And boy, that's a great way to say it and a great picture, because I think we do need give, need to give proper credit to where the Lord, like you said, intervenes and watch for him to do those things in our lives, because he is so active in our lives and he wants the best for us. And he wants to refine us as we get older. He doesn't want us to stay stagnant. He doesn't want my relationship with you to stay the way it was when we were 19 years old in college. You know, I just, I've never thought of it that way before, but to think of, you know, the obedience of responding to his prompting for either of us is such like a gift back to him. Like we were obedient to be vulnerable with each other and look what it's done. And that really gives, well, I, I give God all the credit and glory for that. That's really beautiful. And then because of you, he's brought Amy into my life. And so she got the fast track because she was your friend, right? So you, you got to skip over some of the hard years. And I think vice versa. I think vice versa, you know, like I skipped over some of the hard years with you. If we had this connection with her, we were safe to each other at a good starting point. Well, and, and to your point about Chrissy, very, very deep and and your faith and here's here's an opportunity for me to just speak into both of your lives and for the listeners out there because we didn't all have something that both of you had which is both of you had at least one parent that just both of you are like replicas jenny you of your dad chrissy of you you of your mom both of whom had incredible deep relationships with the lord and so i think that this call to community this call to you know, I think that friendships are who God gives us to live on this earth that thank God we are going to live somewhere different forever one day. But I love, I love the, the vulnerability there. And, but Jenny, you had mentioned something that I think is important here. I think it's important that we highlight it because the timeline for both of you is true on this. But talk to us about the last couple of years. You just a little bit of alluded to it that you really kind of had this convergence of a whole bunch of stuff. You had a significant point, though, where you could no longer ignore that. And you mentioned to me, I went to my stress path, which is a five for the, for, for the Enneagram eights. I would love for you just to talk to us a little bit about that journey. You, you said yourself, up until a certain point, you had not had a lot of difficult experiences in your life, but then you had a bunch at one time. You kept trying to be the eight, kept trying to be the eight, and then That's it all right. came crashing down. That's right. That's what happened then. Like you said, I I really lived a pretty stress-free life in general up and up through my college years and getting married in my early years of marriage. Um, I was raised in a Christian home. Just to give a little background for the people listening who don't know me, I had wonderful parents. I know that's not everybody's story. And I'm 
just grateful that it was mine. A loving family that's still very close to each other. So I got married young at 22, right after college. My husband and I started our lives just the way that we expected to. You know, we both got jobs. We both worked really hard, waited a good long amount of time before we had children. You know, just kind of like uh, my husband is a one, by the way. So he's like checking off all the boxes, super disciplined. And I'm just like a go-getter, like I can do anything. And so we both really enjoyed that season of just kind of like focusing on building up careers so that we could segue into a family later and we did that and we have two kids I have a 16 year old son right now and my daughter who's 11 about to turn 12 and when my son was born I had this really great glamorous job but it took all of my time and I really didn't ever picture myself not doing that job or that career path, but my life changed significantly when I had him. And my father, who was an attorney in town, he um, had a mediation business. He offered me what he said, a deal that I couldn't refuse. He would pay me a drastically terrible salary, but give me a drastically better quality of life because he was my dad. He was the grandfather to this, my new son. Um, and he would give me all the time I needed to acclimate to being a new mom and also give me a job in his office. And so I went to work for my dad and I ran his office. I'm saying all of this to say how ingratiated my family was in each other's lives when um, my son was five. No, when my son was eight. I'll, I'll backtrack. When my son was five, my daughter was born. And at the same time, my dad was having some health problems. And I remember this well because the day my daughter was born, my mom had to decide, was she going to be at the hospital with me having her new granddaughter or go with my dad to this really important appointment with a kidney specialist? Because whatever was happening, they didn't know yet, but my dad was having some pretty bad health issues. So fast forward, my dad was diagnosed with a very, very rare disease that there was no cure for at the time. Um, by the way, they've made a lot of progress on that since, so I'm grateful for that. Um, but he was given three to five years to live, and so he lived four years. He made it exactly in the middle of that time frame that those doctors that gave him. But in the process of those four years, my dad... Basically, I don't know if this is just too harsh to say, but this is my eightness just coming out. He was actively dying um, for four years. And that's an incredibly stressful situation to go through. Um, we all lived and worked around each other. My, my parents were super close with my son. They were, you know, around for the birth of my daughter. And so to, to go through those years of terrible illness with terrible complications and he just was in a lot of pain. It was not an easy road for him. That was probably my first real brush with just something incredibly hard and stressful and traumatic in my life. Well, in that time also, my son was diagnosed with a brain malformation and had to have surgery at five years old. Um, that's just not something you want to go through as a parent. It's not something I would ever want my five-year-old to go through, um, but he came out through that fine. But in the aftermath of that, my son developed some significant issues with anxiety. And he's 16 now, so I told Amy this before we started. His issues with anxiety and depression and panic attack disorders are his story mostly to tell. But being a person who never went through this myself, you know, growing up, as a parent, I look at him now at 16 and I am so proud of and stunned by this kid because he's so willing to talk about everything he's been through. In fact, before I came on this podcast, I said, you know, but you, you have your own story to tell and I will never step in and tell it for you. But I asked if, it, if he was okay with me at least sharing what I just shared with you. And he basically was like, share it all. We can talk about anything. So while that. he does still, I mean, it is a significant daily battle in his life. He also is like the polar opposite of me, whereas like, would anybody like to talk about the most vulnerable things? 
And <laughs> it challenges me. I think God has an incredible sense of humor because it challenges me every day to say, okay, let's go there. Let's go to the really deep places. Let's go to the really significant conversations. Let's talk about all of your angst. But anyway, so we went through that and, um, and to skip ahead towards the end of all of this, I, I had a significant personal health crisis. I had to have a major surgery, um, one that I did not plan to have. And I have dealt with some autoimmune um, rheumatoid arthritis issues for about eight or nine years that have significantly changed my health from a very healthy, vibrant, active, like I felt fine to I could barely get out of bed or walk around the house. So that very long-winded story is to say that these traumatic events in my life compounded to the point, and I did not pay attention to them. So the Enneagram says that for a while you can be on autopilot in your number. Okay, so I handled my dad's death and everything that happened with his illness as an eight. I was on autopilot. So everything that comes naturally came out. I took charge. I handled everything that needed to be handled for my entire extended family. Um, my mom needed to be the sole caregiver for my dad's health needs. Everything else did not need to be her problem. I took on bill paying. I took on running his office. I took on shutting down his office when, he, when we knew he could no longer work, um, selling the business, packing, moving. Um, at the time, I was watching my two very young niece and nephew homeschooling my son for first grade, and I had my own newborn. So I had three newborns in the house and a first grader who I decided this would be a great year to homeschool, <laughs> right? <laughs> Why not? But that was my eightness on autopilot in the stress. Just give me control. I got it. And I'll do my own thing. But please do not tell me how to do this. So I have people speaking into my life. You're probably taking on a little too much. This might not be the right path for you. You may want to slow down or delegate. I was like, don't tell me what to do. I've got this. I'm fine. And what happened was I hit a wall after a few years. You can go a long time, I think, on autopilot. Yeah, I went a long, long time. Long time. Yeah. Okay, right. Right. And you've like shared that beautifully. And sometimes you don't even realize that you are auto, your autopilot has you pointed towards a wall. Okay. I'm a big fan of the show, The Office. I hope this isn't controversial. I love The Office. It's, it's hilarious. And so there's an episode in it where Michael Scott is driving a car and the GPS is telling him like Siri, drive straight. And the people in the car are saying, there's a lake straight ahead of us. And he's like, but the GPS is saying drive straight. And they're like, it's a lake, right? And he drives right into the lake because he's just trusting the autopilot. And that's what I did. I trusted myself and everything I'd known about myself. And I drove myself right into a lake. And so what the Enneagram says is that when you're in stress, you can actually take on the characteristics of a completely different number. Who knew? Right. right? I, you don't become that number for all time and eternity, but your outward behaviors mimic something totally different than you've ever been. And I, I didn't know what was happening to me. Um, in stress, an Enneagram eight goes to five, which is a wonderful, wonderful person, unless you're not used to being that person. You know, and I've had to look into this for a while. The, the five pulls back and researches and evaluates and kind of always is thinking their place in things. They're the researcher. Your energy too, right? So you, you're like, you pull back, like Carissa said on that episode, fives wake up. Like if we get a good night's sleep, we're like, I'm good to go. Fives would be like, I'm only 30% good to go. So everywhere I can conserve my energy because I might run out by the end of the day. And this is who I found myself behaving in. I, I pulled back from everything. I, in fact, I probably owe a lot of people a lot of explanation and apology because, I mean, I just stopped. I stopped everything I was doing. I retreated into myself because nothing made sense anymore. It was just a conglomeration of all the stress for so long and carrying it for so long. And there was not 
there was not a specific event that set that off. I wish I could say, you know, like, look out for this to everyone else. Look out for these practical signs that you might not be doing well. Um, for a lake. Yeah. Right. You're heading for a lake. You're heading for a lake. But I do know that like my, my own surgery and the recovery from that was a pretty, was a, about the last straw and maybe even before that, but I, there was no coming back from because of the surgery I had to have, it really affected my hormones at a time that was critical in my life. Like I said, I'm 45. Um, for the other women out there, we're already dealing with some changes that that we're not used to. And it set my body into those changes almost immediately. Um, I ended up gaining an exceptional amount of weight. That's not just something I say because of like superficial reasons, but it affects the way you feel significantly. And just having to wrestle through that, like what my body is out of my control. Remember what the eights are scared of, not being in control. My body is out of control. My family is out of control. I cannot control and fix what my son fears. I could not control and prevent my dad from dying of this awful disease. I cannot control what anyone in my extended family does from this point forward. They are not mine to control. And when all of that kind of came together, I, I retreated. I just stopped. I needed to conserve all the energy I had. And I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily. I think you need the time. And if you're not going to give it to yourself, you're going to be forced in some way to be given that time. And it, it was not comfortable for me. It was a very odd place to be. Um, but I, I went to five. I researched. I read a ton. I just spent time like kind of bald in a quiet corner of my couch in my pajamas and slippers. That's, that's what it looked like for me to kind of be in a place of stress. And on my phone, reading articles. It's so hard. Um, I don't know how you're feeling right now, but it's it's hard to hear because I love you so much. And and but we noticed. Yeah. We're like, she has fundamentally changed. Mm -hmm. And I know when your dad passed away, who I did not have the pleasure of knowing, but Chrissy did, and so I was alongside for that. And I came to the funeral and all the things. And I remember talking to Chrissy, thinking okay, at some point, this is going to hit her. At some point, this is going to hit her. And that conversation became a years and years and years long conversation where it was going to hit you because I had had the experience of my own lake, which looked a lot like padded walls and a psych ward. I'm glad mm -hmm. to you. But, but trauma, which is what you've just described to us, mm -hmm. will have its way. Full stop. It is the way God made us. We use that cheetah analogy that I used in the first season where cheetahs will run, run, run. They're the fastest on the planet until they can't. And they run into lakes and drown and all the things. And so I am curious before we, we transition into a, a que two questions that we're asking everybody. I think it would be so powerful for you to tell us because you clearly are not in that stress path now. You're, you're not living in the unhealthy portions of a five now. You are thriving. And, and who God made you, First Peter 2, 9, and Genesis uh, 1, and, and Psalm 139, I could go on and on. You're leaning into it. You're on a podcast talking about it. You're doing exactly what you were scared to death of. Can you think of a time with him? Is it a, a dark closet somewhere? Or did, where did God meet you? Where you go, okay, I need to pay attention to this, because this is the point of us doing nine episodes on the Enneagram, is paying attention. So good. So good. And I would love to give you like one point of time because that's a simple, easy answer. And I think people love to have a simple, easy answer that they can grasp onto and say, okay, well then I'll do that if I'm feeling bad. And life is a little more complicated than that. But I will tell you some things that helped me. It helped to have friends who checked in because typically I'm not a person who my friends worry about. So if I get a text to say, I'm a little worried about you, it's a very unusual text for me to receive, a very unusual conversation for me to have with someone. That's a good red flag, you know, if someone's worried about me. And I may not respond to that right away, but that did help. And I do want to say, that's a very good thing and a very approachable thing that friends can do for AIDS. You can tell us hard things about ourselves. We're cool with that because we're, we're not very sensitive in general. It's intriguing to us. So 
and we also are challengers. That's like the dubbed name, the challenger. So we'll go into a situation and be happy to challenge you. And so if you can bring a little of that energy back to us, that's very energizing and inspiring. And because we don't have a lot of people in our lives who will do that with us, it like bumps you up a couple notches in our book. Like, okay, I like this. I like that you're challenging me because I get a, I get a, a lot of energy out of that. So to have people say things like, I'm noticing this about you, or this is not the way you would normally respond was very helpful because of the two of you and your constant encouragement, I will call it. <laughs> I went and saw a counselor. <laughs> That was incredibly helpful. Not so much for what the counselor said, because I think you could get a good counselor, you can get a bad counselor, you can get someone who's in between, you can have the most incredible experience, or one that you're just walk away going, okay. But the fact that you have taken that initiative to talk to someone else who is educated and professionally capable of working with you on your issues, invaluable. So I think something started to change when I took some feedback from friends. I went to a counselor only twice. So I might be different than a lot of people that you interview. Some people go for years. You have a counselor that you're like very connected to, right? I mean, like who even came on your podcast and did this incredible, incredible, Dr. Pettit was just amazing. Um, there can be, but just to start the process and let yourself admit that you need some additional outside help was really helpful to me. And to speak to your eight nest, that only took five or six years. Right. <laughs> no we, time at all. Like, like we are never on a short track with me. <laughs> like, like, like Jenny, when are you going to be a counselor? Jenny, when are you going to go to counselor? Jenny? And so I just love how you weave in the, the mission of the podcast and that answer, because I too have experienced the depth of, of Chrissy, as many people have, have heard on this podcast, but yeah, it, you know what, if you have five friends and you have five good ones, that is community. We talk about that all the time on this podcast, regardless of, there are some people that listen to this podcast who don't believe in the star of the story, but what we all can do is be in community. And then also that counseling aspect. I just think that it's so, so important. I have, it's been kind of cool to watch the old Jenny, and I'm air quoting this when I say back, because there was a period of time where I know I was very worried about you, but Chrissy knew you well enough to go, don't push it, don't push it, don't push right. it. And so there's a lot of time on my knees and, and she and I talking about how can we come along Jenny um, better. And so listeners out there, what she just so beautifully described to you, and, and I, we don't have time on this podcast to tell you where your stress path goes to. Mine goes to a eight who I'm talking to. And that is very, very true about me sixes go to Three. threes, but the stress path is something that to, to be examined. And I find it interesting. And one of the reasons why I really am so honored that you came on is because this is a podcast about trauma. And that was a boatload of trauma that you explained to us and in an abbreviated form. Chrissy and I happen to be more privy to a little bit more. And so, so proud of you. I want to say that. I'm so proud of you for all of those things. But eights out there, hear Jenny when she speaks, because this fear of being controlled and betrayed and vulnerable and all the things is going to send you down a bad path, particularly in the presence of trauma. Speaking of trauma, Chrissy, there was an important question that you wanted to ask every number about something that we globally have gone through over the past 20 months. I would love to hear your question and how the eight responds to, to that question. Well, just going through the pandemic and, and how, how has that how has that affected you as an eight? How is it affecting you now? Wow, the pandemic is something else. And I think if you asked 100 people how they're handling it, you'd get 100 different answers. I think a lot of people think that, you know, there's like two major divisions of like how you handle or where you fall or how you, but I think it's all so nuanced for each person. And in my eightness, I think if I had, um, if I have been doing this a little longer, like back in, you know, kind of feeling more like myself for a little bit longer before all this happened, I might have had a very different response. But 
And thank you for saying that you see like the old Jenny. I appreciate that. I want, I want that back. Like, this is what I'm fighting for. This is what I'm doing the hard work for is to get back to that. I think that's the place. That's what God created me to be. And so um, to be a good steward of the temperament that he's given me, I'm fighting for that daily. I'm fighting for that, but I'm still kind of straddling the fence. So you'll see a lot of eightness come out. So if I feel strongly about something in regards to research, I mean, let's not talk about research for a minute. That's the five. But in regards to just my gut response, that can come out really clearly. It's my husband and I actually disagree on a lot of the way that we've handled the last 18 months. And it's funny. We, we can get a laugh out of it now, but um, he's, he is very buttoned up in all of his research and knows what he's talking about. And he's very logical and rational too. Um, but I respond out of my gut. And so my very first thought, usually I can trust it. And it's, it's a pretty good one, but I am like, I'll debate you to the, so, <laughs> so raising two children, figuring out what our protocols in our own house will be. How do we manage and navigate this system? How do we keep each other healthy? How do we protect our friends and family? When we've disagreed, it's been intense in our house um, because I respond so strongly in my eightness. However, I'm still straddling. I'm still trying to come out of, you know, this place that I've been in for the last several years where I was operating as a five. So I also will take tons of time and do tons of research on whatever information I can find. And boy, this is a hard place to be because, you know, everything is still evolving. Um, we know that we keep calling this time unprecedented. That's not true. It's, it's precedented. These things have happened before, just not in our generation. And we, this is our first time yes. navigating careers in this. This is our first time just being human beings in this. This is, if we have kids, our children's first time doing this. So for us, we don't have a lot of places we can fall back on and say, what did you do 10 years ago when this happened? That didn't happen 10 years ago. To still have a foot in my stress path of five helps me to slow down. And I'm still grateful for that. It helps me not to make a whole lot of rash judgments um, about what other people are doing, because I can be judgmental. It helps me to um, just try and find the best resolution and what's best for our family. But in my eightness, this is something that I cannot control everything about. And I hate that. I bet that just uh, blew you to smithereens because I, I hate it, it so much. Yeah. I hate everything about it. I hate how many people are hurting. I hate how divided everyone is. And I hate that there's something that we cannot at this point in time control 100%. I, not, not everybody else. I'll leave it to the people who can. I cannot control this. I am vulnerable to this. I am weak and powerless against not against every, you know, like I'm not trying to say this is the most dire thing in the world, but I am weak and powerless to bring everyone together right. to make sense of the divisions that we have when we all approach this from our different angles. I'm just going down and looking at the core fears. This hits all of mine. It just makes me feel very, very wow. vulnerable, very controlled and very powerless. And so there's a point at which I have to just say, Lord, you, you know, the beginning, you know, the end, you know, how much I love the people that I love. And you love us more than we can even possibly fathom. And I have to trust him. I, I think that's the crux of it. It really is. And as I've said on other, other podcast episodes, particularly in season three here, if you are listening, you're out there listening and whether you're an eight or not, but if you do not know Jesus as your savior, all you have to do is go into the show notes, click on the contact Amy, and we will make sure that we can introduce you to the star of the story. Because while these are not unprecedented times to Jenny's point, there is nothing we can do about it except for the best we can. And I can see how, because I go to an eight in stress and I, I could see how hard it must be for eights out there um, as somebody that absolutely went to eight when the, when the pandemic hit. 
And so, well, finally, we would just, we want to ask you this question and you've said some of it in the interview, but just kind of as a capstone question, what do you want your friends, families, people that don't know you to know about AIDS that we can come along and do life better? And, and, and Chrissy, feel free to add to that question. Is there anything else that, that, we, that would be helpful for Jenny to speak to other AIDS? Or not to other AIDS, but to those of us who love, love AIDS. AIDS. Yeah. Particularly in Um, Sure. So there's a, there's a book called The Road Back to You, which is a book about the Enneagram. I don't know if all of your listeners are familiar with it. Um, and it's co-written. And one of the people, one of the co-writers, her name is Suzanne Stabile. And I heard her on another podcast one time. And she said this about the eights. First of all, she said it's one of the most misunderstood numbers. I think because we come off very tough and very challenging, it's a little intimidating to deal with us. And I've been told that. I've tried to refine my behavior and I always pray. I mean, I have prayed since I remember being five years old and knowing about the fruit of the spirit, which is, for those of your listeners who aren't familiar with it, when you know and love Jesus, when, when the Holy Spirit is in charge of your life, then there is evidence of that in your life. You don't have to try for it. You don't have to, I mean, you need to, you need to be humble and let him work through you, but you don't like check off a list. Like I'm today, I'm going to work on being joyful or being loving, but the fruit that comes out of having the Holy Spirit live and work in you is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness and self-control. And I remember thinking from a very young age, I'm going to need a whole lot of help then. (laughs) (laughs) Like it's, it's going to have to, you're going to have to be so evident in me. Um, So if there is any behavior in me that doesn't seem caustic and confrontational and upfront and intimidating, that's, that's Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit's work because in my flesh, those are the things that I want to be. I want to be gut response, hard, strong reactions. And that's why I think eights on the Enneagram in general, if we are not being refined by God's work in our lives, we are very misunderstood. And, and maybe people don't want to be around us unless they need us to be. So Suzanne, Suzanne Stabile said on this podcast, and it resonated so much with me that this is a lot of the way that people interact with eights. She said, we really love for them to be eights, except when we don't. And when they try to step back and live into being less upfront, then as soon as something goes wrong, we invite them back to the front and we ask them to do the very things that we asked them to stop doing. And I had to like stop that podcast, rewind it, play it over again, because I never felt like someone was so inside my brain. Because when I get hurt, or feel betrayed in relationships, this especially is what comes to mind, is that you asked me to be this strong for this season, and then you you like ripped the rug out from under me and said, no, thank you, you're too much, or we don't need that perspective right now. And the inside of me is screaming, but you do, (laughs) you need me. (laughs) You know, you know, um, here's another, I watch too much TV or movies, this will be my second uh, quote from Hollywood, but you know, from a few good men, Jack Nicholson is in that courtroom and not the most famous line, but the one right before that, where he says, you want me on that wall. You yes, need me on that wall. wall. <laughs> it's that, that's my response to what she said. You know, like, you need me here. Why are you pushing me away? <laughs> that is so great. So yeah. True. So, so, so those, those of you yeah. out there listening, what she's saying is utilize them. Yeah. Yes. Right? Embrace who they are and don't try to make them who they aren't. Right. And don't push them back. I mean, we need people to step up. I am not that person. I need AIDS. That would be an understatement. <laughs> and we need people to balance us out. We need our six friends, our two friends, our five friends. We need the five in ourselves to come out. We need the two in ourselves to come out. You know, we need, we need to really experience a whole variety of people who will soften us and refine our edges, our, what might be our rough edges sometimes. And then I said this earlier, but I'll just kind of wrap up with that. We also can handle being challenged. And so when you ask like, what can your community be for you? 
just hold us to the things that you know are important to us. I had a friend one time and I said, I, I told her, I said, I am trusting God for this for the situation that was, I was a little scared of, but I told her, and this was years ago, and I still remember it because she's one of the few people who's challenged me. And so I, she's one of the five on my hand of five friends. This is what helps us connect. She's, I said to her one time, I'm really struggling with this, but I am giving it to the Lord and he is going to, he's going to work the situation out, you know, for my good and for his glory and I will trust him. Well, a few months, weeks later, I was kind of, operating in my own self. And she said, stop it. You told me that you were giving this to the Lord on this day. And I have it written down in my journal because it was in a Bible study. And she's like, and I'm not going to let you back down from that. And I thought for a second, I have never had anyone be that bold and upfront with me before. And I love it. So with your friends who are eights, you can challenge them. And it you know, now, now I have to tell my fellow eights, like I've given everyone permission to challenge us. So you better be good about it. You better be nice with that responsibility. Yeah, be gentle. Um, yeah like be gentle with your friends who, who challenge you. But we need that. We need people to hold us, hold our strengths up for us and make sure that they're going in the right direction. Yeah, because you're bold and you're bold in your faith. And I think that, that we need that as, as, especially in the world that we live in today, as of this recording, recording in 2021. And we need, we need that kind of boldness mm -hmm. in this world. Well, Jenny, as I, as we, as we close the podcast, I like to, to try to leave a little something for everyone. And I, because I, we're so close friends, I've been more mesmerized by this conversation than podcast host. But one of the, the messages that I, I want to share with you just from my heart to yours and to other Enneagram eights out there is a song that just happens to be pretty popular right now. And the lyric, it goes something like this. And I hope that you will feel the freedom to do this when you are scared, when you're vulnerable, when you're in that place, you're like, I am not talking to a single soul. I am, I am moving towards my stress, stress path and all the things. I love the lyric to this song. A couple people sing it, but I like Cody Carnes. I run to the father, fall into grace, done with the hiding. There's no reason. So I run to the father, my heart found a surgeon, my soul found a friend. So I run to the father again and again. And I hope that you will find rest in that because he is the only thing, the only person I will betray you. Chrissy probably won't. I will, betray <laughs> you. I will fail you as your friend. But when we run to the Father and we fall in the grace, we're done with the hiding. There's, there's no time to waste. Mm -hmm. Our heart needs a surgeon. Our soul needs a friend. So let's run to the Father again and again. That's beautiful. So I hope that type eights out there see that. And the other message, Jenny, that I want to give to you, and you've got all the merch. Uh, you're one of my supporters, and I'm so grateful for that. So you see this, but... Listeners out there, you know what I'm going to say as I end this and as we will see you back here two weeks in the healing zone for the Enneagram type nine, which will end this part of this first third season is you are seen, you are known, you are loved, you are valued, heard and valued. You are heard, you are valued. I love that message so much, Amy. Thank yes, you. You are seen, you are known, you are heard, you are loved, you are valued. And so thank you so much, guys. We'll see you in two weeks here in the Healing Zone. We appreciate everything that you do. You give us your time. And as I always say, we are not making more of that. If you are not subscribed to the podcast, please write there when you're in your app. Just open it up and hit follow or subscribe. We would love your support. If you're looking for me, I am easy to find. Also in the show notes, just click contact Amy. And there you will find a link tree where you can contact me and all of the places. Until then, let the healing continue. Let my life glorify you and teach me to walk beside you. And